All right, so you asked for it, uh, and due to popular demand, you're getting it today, Baptism Part 2. Hello everyone, and God bless. This is Father Mikhail, Father Michael, with another episode of uh, Living Orthodox. So in light of the fact that this is a really popular request and that I have been forestalling putting this out for months, really just wanting to get it right and have the right materials to pull from, um, I feel it's important uh, at this time to, to bring this video out. Now, of course, this is probably gonna make me some enemies. I really don't care. Um, I'm here to just simply say the truth uh, and, and to, to give what I've been given and to stand by what I believe is, is the correct way and what the Holy Fathers, what the saints have upheld. And so that's, that's why we're, we're going to do this today. Um, now, of course, um, <clears throat> the OCA Synod recently put out a um, really interesting uh, statement about baptism in which they, they open up by saying that the standard case is you know is that or that they as they put it you know that uh, the heterodox must be received via baptism but then they make a long list of exceptions that basically um, exempts every heterodox confession now this is and this is my opinion and, and i'm in no way encouraging people to be uh, disrespectful or disobedient to their bishops but we're going to take this apart a little bit now, before I go any further, uh, a quick little update. So my health is doing pretty okay. Uh, I had a pretty nasty sinus infection, and that was, um, you know, in regard to the announcement I, waited, uh, I made a few weeks ago. That's why I had to go to the hospital. I thought my hernia might have become strangulated because I had uh, such a severe fever. And uh, it turns out it was just due to a really bad infection. So uh, going forward... Um, I am going to be having a consultation this month about my uh, uh, about my hernia, and uh, on the 18th, and then hopefully after that it won't be much longer before the surgery. And excuse me, I'm going to close my door because my son is uh, feeling the need to ramble very loudly downstairs. So uh, that said, um, I feel like this topic is one that unfortunately is the source of a lot of infighting online. There has been statements made by laymen who, because they have a master's degree or a PhD or, or anything, uh, you know, of an academic nature, a, a worldly accreditation, think that they have the right to guide the church and give their opinion on everything. And I don't care about their opinions, and I'm going to be quite honest, neither should you. You know, you should listen to priests, you should listen, listen to bishops. That said, provided that they are listening to the Holy Fathers, provided they are carrying on in the way that their office dictates that they should. Not just in their examples, but in what they're doing as priests, what they're doing as bishops. Um, I've been blessed to have the bishop I have. I, I'm blessed to, have, uh, to work with the priests that I've worked with and, uh, and I'm continuing to work with right now. Um, you know, it's one of those things where, despite it being so divisive, it really shouldn't be. But we just need to say it, that these people who are saying that we can chrismate everyone and that that should be the standard form of reception, they're wrong. Plain and simple. If you, if you want the short answer, there it is right there. They're wrong. Now, why are they wrong? Well, I've got a couple books here that I am going to pull from. Uh, the first one being a collection of, of uh, the different uh, ecumenical councils and their canons. So first, let's look at what Canon 1 of St. Basil the Great says. As to the question concerning the Puritans, the custom of every country is to be observed, since they who have discussed this point are various se uh, sentiments. The baptism of the Pepuzinis I make no account of, and I wonder that Dionysius the canonist was of another mind. The ancients speak of heresies which entirely break men off and make them aliens from faith. Such are the Manichaeans, the Valentinians, the Marcionites, the Pepuzinis, who sin against the Holy Ghost, who baptize 
into the Father, Son, and Montanus or Priscilla. Schisms are caused by ecclesiastical disputes and for causes that are not incurable and for differences concerning penance. The Puritans are such schismatics. The ancients, uh, such as Cyprian and, and Vermilion, put these in the Incretites and, hyper, um, <laughs> and Hydroparistate and uh, Apoctactis under the same condemnation because they have no longer the communication of the Holy Ghost who have broken the succession. They who first made the departure had the spiritual gift, but by being schismatics, they became laymen, and therefore they ordered those that were baptized by them and came over to the church to be purged by the true baptism as those that are baptized by laymen. So, you know, he now he, of course, goes on to say, because some in Asia have otherwise determined, let their baptism be allowed, but not that of the Incretites, for they have altered their baptism to make themselves incapable of being received by the church. Yet custom in the fathers, that is, bishops, who have the administration must be followed, for I am afraid of putting an impediment to the saved. While I would raise fears in them concerning their baptism, we are not to allow their baptism, because they allow ours, but strictly to observe the canons. A lot of the time, I feel like, especially with the, the spirit of, uh, of the pan-heresy of ecumenism that has infiltrated the church, that people tend to think that, well, you know, the Catholics acknowledge our baptisms, and well, maybe some Protestants do, but that means we should acknowledge theirs. This is not a kumbaya session around a campfire. We're talking about our immortal souls here. We're talking about uh, the path to salvation. Now, that said, St. Paisios, uh, for example, was very anti-ecumenistic. And he said, we, we mustn't tell the heterodox they're going to hell. You know, we can't speak for the judgment of God. We can't speak for that. We know God is merciful, but what that mercy looks like beyond this life is certainly not necessarily what our definition of mercy would be. <laughs> Excuse me. And he says it this way. He says that we mustn't tell them that they're right either because they're not. They don't have the truth. Rather, we must give them a good uneasiness. And that good uneasiness comes from not, you know, attacking them left, right, and center, but it doesn't come from affirming error. And unfortunately, you will see this a lot online with certain people where they affirm error. Now, before we go further, I do want to make a quick other disclaimer. If you have been received via chrismation, I'm not saying that you're not a member of the church and neither of the Holy Fathers. If you've been received by chrismation, you've been communing, you are a member of the church. However, if you feel like something's wrong, if you feel like something's missing, you should definitely talk to your priest about this, to your spiritual father, to your bishop if you have to. And that being said, if none of them are willing to listen on this, and if you really you know, come to the conclusion that, wait a minute, I should have been baptized, then you need to go and take care of that. If that means having to go somewhere else to another jurisdiction, then go. Because you know what? We don't own people. A jurisdiction, a priest, a parish doesn't own you. You belong to God. And if all the canonical Orthodox churches are the true church of Christ, which they are, and we have that proper Catholicity, then you are home anywhere where the sacraments are celebrated canonically in a canonical church. That is your home. It is your right to be there. And no one has the right to prevent you from going. So, you know, we have to look at, at this. What is baptism? Baptism is our uniting to Christ. This is where the, the curse of ancestral sin is removed, where our ability to repent is instilled, and we are united physically and spiritually to Christ. We are grafted in. Why? Because the church has this grace. And we have this grace because we have the grace to forgive sins, to remit sins. You know, as Christ pointed out in the Gospel of John, where he says that he gives each of them the ability to bind and loose. Whosoever sins you retain are retained. Whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Right? We, we know this. And baptism remits sins. And this was one of the arguments that St. Cyprian makes, by the way, that St. Cyprian of Carthage makes, that if we believe that they've become laymen, that is, the schismatics, the heterodox, because they have broken off from the true church, then they don't have the ability to remit sins, and thus their baptisms don't have that grace. They don't have that sacramental ability. By saying that, we acknowledge their baptisms, or worse, as I've seen some ignorant and, forgive me, flat-out arrogant 
masters of divinity students who think that they are the, the epicenter of knowledge for the church have said online, you know, that, oh, we don't rebaptize. You're right, we don't rebaptize. But to quote my friend uh, and, and mentor, who I got to, to have at least a, you know, a brief bit of time with down at, at Jordanville, um, here among Theodore, who's on uh, Holy Trinity Seminary's new um, YouTube channel, which is, I believe it is called The Light of This World, or The Light of the World. Uh, it's, it's a really good channel, check it out. He says it perfectly there. We don't rebaptize because ours is the only baptism. If we believe there's only one Christ, and he's synonymous with his church, which we see evidence of in the book of Acts, then there's only one baptism. There is one baptism for the remission of sins, and those outside the church do not have it. We have it. Now that said, there are times where economia can be applied. And what does the word economia mean? Well, it comes from a Greek word meaning to manage the household or to have exception. But it is never to supplant the ekrevia, because if it supplants the ekrevia, then it's no longer economia. But the ekrevia is the exactitude. St. Paisios, many other elders from Mount Athos, many saints have said that the economia should never, ever supplant the ekrevia. It should never replace it. So we have to be very clear on this. If we believe that you know no one else, including you know the Latins, have the Holy Eucharist, that only we have this, then why are we saying that they have baptism or anyone else for that matter? If they've made themselves laymen, having cut themselves off from the church, how can they have this? Let's, let's go to another one of St. Basil's canons. Let's go, let's go to, to this canon right here. So, in Cratitis Sacophorians, and apatitis, sorry if well, my Greek's not very good, are in the same case with the novitians. We rebaptize them all. Rebaptize, meaning that they are baptized had they been received into that church exclusively. Now, that says that said, if an Orthodox Christian apostatizes and loses the grace of the Holy Spirit, we don't rebaptize them. Meaning that, that the only person who could be possibly re-baptized and thus have that sin to worry about is someone who was born into the orthodox church let's give a hypothetical example and they at one point schismatize and become protestant or catholic whatever and then they decide to come back home we wouldn't baptize them you know the catholics might have the, the, the protestants might have baptized uh, baptized them but we don't need to do that and we shouldn't do that because they have once in their life received the baptism of the church what we do instead is we chrismate them back into the church. That is the proper way it's done. When someone has apostatized, they are chrismated. They're not baptized when they return. However, if someone was baptized Roman Catholic, was baptized Protestant, it doesn't matter. Baptize them, baptize them all. Everyone gets a baptism. Everyone should be baptized. That's what we do in Roper. We baptize pretty much well everyone. Um, you know, the Monophysites, yeah, baptize them. You know, th that's any of the Oriental Orthodox confessions, Orthodox, for those of you who might want to attack that wording. It just makes it easier so people who are new to this kind of discussion will know who we're talking about. Let's, you know, let's just keep on track with what the message is here. So rebaptize them all. There is a diversity in the canons relating to the Novitians, no canon concerning the other. Well, what is that diversity? Clearly re regarding people who were previously orthodox who apostatized and came back <clears throat> if it be forbid with you as it is at rome for prudential causes now, we can go over some examples of prudential causes yet let reason prevail they are a branch of the marcionists and though they baptize in the name of the three divine persons yet they make god the author of evil and assert that wine and the creatures of god are defiled there are certain groups of calvinists who do this there are certain protestants who who have this view that any form of alcohol, any form of wine is bad. They're to be baptized, these people. The bishops ought to meet and so to explain the canon that he who does baptize such heretics may be out of danger and that one may have a positive answer to give those that ask it. And why is that important? Because of course, with baptism, sometimes we have to do renunciations, renunciations of errors. Why to affirm publicly and with the person themselves 
that this isn't how we do things in the Orthodox Church. That's not Orthodox. So you're leaving it out. You're casting it out. You're removing that spiritual influence from you even. And starting with a clean and fresh slate. It's very important when people come from certain backgrounds. Uh, and you'll find examples of this in the Book of Needs. Uh, the Hapgood Book of Needs in particular has a list of renunciations. Um, the one from St. Deacon's has a shorter list. I have my theories on that. Love St. Saint, Deacon's Saint publications. Certain things from them are really great. Certain things I, I wish they would expand upon. I wish they'd bring back the four volumes of the Book of Needs. Because, uh, you know, us English-speaking priests need that. You know, maybe maybe Rokor could put one out. That would be great. Um, we have to we have to be consistent here with ourselves. Why do we call ourselves Orthodox? Because we adhere to tradition. Because we adhere to what's been given to us. We're not Orthodox if we're constantly bending the knee for politics, for feel good, mushy feelings. That's not what the church is about. It's not about your feelings. It's not even about your opinions. It's about what is true. So moving forward, and again, there have been some online who have made egregious comments about St. Delarney and Troitsky and saying that he was um, only made a saint because he was a martyr, not because of his theology. That, that is, I'm sorry, that's heresy. For one, yes, he was he was a hero martyr and he was martyred and that is what assured him his sainthood, which gave him his canonization. But again, I will take the sanctity and sainthood of a martyred bishop who was well taught, who believed in the firm traditions of the church over the opinions of a layman who believes himself or herself to be qualified to judge the church. You're not. So, you know, all these people with Jacob's Well, the wheel, um, other people online, don't listen to these people. You know, their opinions are just that. They're opinions, and they're formed off of academic reasoning. And unlike with St. Paisios and the other great saints of our time, they're not illumined by grace. And I'm not saying I am. I'm certainly not a saint, but I trust what they have to say over those who poo-poo what they say. So let's let's read a little excerpt from, from The Dogma of the Church by St. Delarian Troitsky. You can pick this up from Uncut Mountain Press. You can also get it on Amazon. You can pick it up from uh, the Holy Trinity uh, Church Supply Store at Jordanville. Um, it's a thick book and it is fantastic because it, right in the opening 20 some odd pages of the book, we have the truth bombs coming down. We have, we have absolute beautiful, unreserved truth. So let's begin. Christianity, likewise, is not merely a teaching received by the intellect and maintained differently by each. Maybe this is why some of those affirmationed ac academics take issue with St. Delarian. No Christianity is life. It's life in which individual persons are so greatly united amongst themselves that their union may be likened to the essential unity of the persons of the Holy Trinity. It was for this that men might be made a unity that in, <clears throat> made a unity in the church that the Lord Jesus Christ prayed to his heavenly father, Christ places love as the foundation for men's unification in the church. Pointing to the unanimity of the persons of the Holy Trinity as the ideal of the church in the same prayer, he said, let the love wherewith thou hast loved me be in them and I in them. It was this incomparable mutual love of the persons of the Holy Trinity that the Lord Jesus Christ exhorted his disciples to emulate in his parting conversation with them. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another and as I have loved you. All right. So in love, we're also going to tell the truth here. So why is baptism so important? That men might enter this union of love, that they might be united into the church. Human nature itself had to be recreated. And what I really appreciate with this book, they put it in bold. As it had become contaminated by sin, which always opposes any human unity. In his conversion with Nicodemus, the Lord Jesus Christ talks about how a man might be born anew. It is for this very rebirth, which is, wait, what was it by? Water and the Spirit. Right. Baptism, chrismation. It is for this very rebirth of human nature, for this recreation thereof, that the incarnation of the Son of God and his death on the cross were needed. In the person of Christ, mankind became participant in divine nature. For without the incarnation of the Son of God, the unification of men in the church would have been impossible. The church has as its foundation the incarnation of the Son of God. And what does baptism do? It grafts us to him. It unites us in him. 
In order to be a member of the reborn mankind, one must have a real connection with Christ, the God-man. For this reason, Christ said, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. Schismatics, the word schism literally means to rupture, to break off, are no longer attached to the vine. The nutrients of the grace-filled life of the church is no longer in them. They've, they've grafted themselves to the world. You know, they're, they're on the ground there. They've lost their leaves. There's no grace. They're not bearing fruit. It's not their fault, but it's their fault if they come to the knowledge of this truth and they remain there. Look at what St. Ignatius of Antioch says in his epistles. He who drinks from the cup of the schismatic will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Those are heavy words. Do you think St. Ignatius of Antioch lacks love? By saying this, what about Christ who taught, who warns about the shepherd who will come by some other way and try to steal the sheep? That he's a thief who enters the sheepfold. All right, what, what about when Christ says, and they will be one flock and they will have one shepherd? We're seeing a connection here that, that there's this oneness, this unity that can only be found in the flock of Christ. The life of reborn mankind, the life of the church, is sustained by its constant connection with God. In order to enter the church, one must be born from on high, born of water and the Spirit. He must be begotten of the Spirit. It's pretty strong stuff. And, and you know, to summarize it, he says this is not only theoretical truth, but also moral truth. Church is his church. Christ's church is a supernatural, grace-filled joining of men reborn by God, by the God-man into a union of love. It is a community, and it must differ significantly from all natural human coalitions into communities. You know, this is the kingdom of heaven, it is not of this world, it is not of worldly nature. It is not like political kingdoms founded upon power and coercion or playing the suck-up game. Let's be honest. When certain of Christ's disciples, not understanding the nature of the new unification of men, which he preached, asked themselves ordinary earthly power in his kingdom, he answered them, you know what ye ask. You know not what you ask of me. You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them and that they are great, uh, and they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. Right? So we're getting the idea here. He's talking about how the church is otherworldly, and the only way to be a part of this church is to be baptized. Now, like I said, if you weren't baptized and you were chrismated, there are so many factors that go into economia. It's not that you're not a member of the church, but if, if this is starting to raise questions within you, which it is always good for us to have questions. And even if you are baptized and this is raising questions within you, am I maintaining my baptismal garment? Am I maintaining my promise to God? It should. You should be uneasy. You should be very uneasy. Now, why is it so important aside from all these other factors, to get baptized. Well, you know, let, let's say it like this. In Rokor, at least, when we do the, the prayers of the making of a catechumen, which include the exorcisms, we do that at the baptismal font. And I know, unfortunately, many cases where people have been chrismated and those prayers have been omitted and they've ended up having problems. I've had many people reach out to me having problems because they were not baptized. They experienced very strange spiritual problems, some of them more uh, insidious in nature. Uh, and at some point, we will do a talk on exorcism in the Orthodox Church, but everyone should be receiving one upon their entrance into the church upon baptism. You know, it's an opportunity to clean out that influence and to make sure that the, the new life in Christ is as clean as possible, that it is good to go. Let's go back to the Holy Fathers of the Ecumenical Councils for a moment. Let's um, let's go back and, and visit a point I want to make, because some people will decry St. Cyprian of Carthage and St. Familia and say, well, it was just a local council. Well, it's not binding. Well, let's look at what the second canon of the fifth Ecumenical Council has to say. It has also seemed good to this Holy Council that the 85 canons received and ratified by the Holy and Blessed Fathers before us and also handed down to us in the name of the Holy and Glorious Apostles should from this time forth remain firm and unshaken for the cure of souls and the healing of disorders. And in these canons, we are bidden to receive the constitutions of the Holy Apostles written by Clement. So let's skip ahead. But we set our seal likewise upon all the other holy canons set forth by our holy and blessed fathers, that is, by the 318 holy God-bearing fathers assembled at Nicaea, and those at Ancria, further those at neo Caesarea, and likewise those at Gangra, and besides those at Antioch and Syria. So they're, they're just basically saying, like, this is who we're all calling on. Moreover, the canons set forth by 
St. Cyprian, Archbishop of the country of the Africans, a martyr, and by the synod under him, which has been kept only in the country of the aforesaid bishops, according to the custom delivered down to them, and not that no one be allowed to transgress or disregard the aforementioned canons, or to receive others beside them, supposed, uh, superstitiously set forth by certain who have attempted to make traffic of the truth. So basically they're ratifying here, but, but should that anyone be convicted of innovating upon or attempting to overturn any of the aforementioned canons, he shall be subject to receive the penalty which that canon imposes and to be cured of it by his transgression. So right there, that's pretty telling. It's pretty telling. You know, we really have to, we really, really have to make it clear that the only way to be received into the church is by baptism. It is the one true church. We have the sacramental grace. If we have the grace of Holy Communion, we practice closed communion. Why are we practicing open baptism? Christ is not a polygamist. He doesn't have multiple wives. This is, you know, somewhere down the line of what Vladimir Lasky referred to as something akin to an historian ecclesiology in which we, we break apart the divine and human nature of Christ. There are not two churches. You know, I believe actually that St. Ilarion goes on to say this somewhere else. Uh, that there cannot be two churches. Yeah, that uh, the field is of the world. He that soweth the good seed of the Son of Man. Um, can't find it right now, but it's, uh, you know, he says here, one who disobeys the church falls away from it and becomes estranged from it like a heathen and a publican and consequently is deprived of the grace-filled aid that is essential to true life. So anyone outside of this grace-filled community, by that logic and reason, doesn't have the ability to enact the grace of baptism. Now, where can we apply economia? Well, there are situations where due to physical disability, someone may not be able to be lowered into a baptismal font. You know, so we could, we could at that point maybe practice pouring if it's necessary. You know, if someone's on their deathbed or bedridden and they can't get out and they want to be baptized into the church, that's a fair option. If you're in the desert, someone's dying and wants to be baptized and is looking like there's no way out, you can baptize them with sand. You know, there, there's so many things. And, and if none of those options are available, if, if there's no water for whatever reason, then yeah, as long as they've been baptized in the name of the Trinity, chrisme, and if not, find a way to make it happen. Find a way. There's always a way. God will make a way if we put him first, if we pray, if we put him first, if we approach this with humility. But, you know, we're, we're depriving ourselves of these tools. We're depriving ourselves of this grace. And a lot of the time, there is no excuse. We have the means. We, we, we live, most of us live in the West here. We have the means to do it. So do it. Baptize. You know, ultimately, we shouldn't be fearing the opinions of academics. We should be fearing the opinion of God. And they do not get to change the rules. They don't get to change what God has laid forth. And if you notice, the count, uh, the councils, the canons, they don't change anything that Christ has taught. They affirm it. And if anything, they will make avenues and pathways so that people can attain salvation, that they not be impeded. But it doesn't change. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the truth. Now, with that said, dear ones, thank you for tuning in. Um, I think I've said all that I really have to say on this matter right now. Um, I'm going to look into maybe doing a live stream at some point. And maybe I'll invite uh, uh, someone to come on the show and talk about this with me, uh, another priest I would like to, or maybe a monastic who would be willing to do it. Um, you know, I'd like to, uh, to at least maybe even dive into this with someone who has a lot of experience in this area. Now, actually to quickly double back, where you could see an example of a corrective baptism in scripture is in the book of Acts. There were people who received the baptism of John and they came to be baptized by the apostles. And, you know, if, if we were to apply the same humanistic worldly thinking that seems to be pervading the church right now to that situation, would the apostles have just simply laid hands on them? But they didn't. They didn't just simply lay hands on all those who'd received baptism from John the Baptist. They baptized them in the name of the Holy Trinity. They baptized them the way that Christ had ordered. And Christ himself says at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, to go forth and baptize all nations, teaching them 
you know, whatever I have commanded you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Lord, have mercy on, on, on all of us, especially as we enter Holy Week. And, and don't, don't go getting into fights about this, you know, especially during the Holy Week. Keep the Holy Week holy. But remember that baptism is a type of our own burial in which, you know, we, we're unified to Christ that way. And it, it is a foretype of our resurrection as well. And as we're heading towards Golgotha and the glorious resurrection of our Lord, keep these things in mind. Keep your mind focused on them. Focus on what you can remove from your life that is barring you. And if you have questions about your baptism, seek a priest who might be able to help you. If you're in the, the southwestern Ontario area of Canada, um, you know, and you're wanting to get baptized into the church and maybe your priest is insisting on chrismation and, and you're not sure what to do, you know, feel free to give me a call or, or, or reach out to me via the email for the channel. Um, that said, I can't always get back to everyone. There, there sometimes is quite a volume of emails um, and I will prioritize. But uh, that said, again, thank you so much. If you're interested in supporting the channel, I will include a link to the Patreon. And uh, I am going to be continuing the GoFundMe. Um, the reason being is, is that the original thing that, uh, that I was looking at for being able to work full time as a priest did not pan out, um, the ability to move my family uh, at the time and what was offered was just, uh, you know, it, it just wasn't going to pan out. Um, it just didn't work out. So I'm going back to school. I'm actually starting school, uh, technically on bright Monday. Uh, I'll be pushing that back, you know, a couple of days for my, for my, uh, consultation and, and of course to observe things properly with the church. Um, but I'll be going back to school uh, to do some work, of, more of a counseling nature. Um, it's one of the reasons why uh, I got a haircut in case anyone cares. Uh, that and I, I have very severe dermatitis and I don't want to risk certain things falling into the chalice. And so it was with uh, you know a lot of deliberation that I decided to go that route with cutting the hair and of course with going back to school. Anyways, thank you so much for your continued support. Please like, share, and subscribe. And uh, God be with you all, and God bless you this holy week.